and gentlemen, can I have a few moments of your time to talk about our Lord and Saviour, King Shark? No? <laughs> Let's just do a Doctor Who podcast instead, then. So this week, we've got... They had no idea I was going to do that. That's a real reaction. Uh... Wait, wait, hang on. We're not actually talking about King Shark? The fuck am I doing here, then? <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Have you seen that red? This that red is not is amazing. my beautiful house, and this is not my beautiful king shark. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that red? That Suicide Squad king shark's friend is amazing. It's amazing. If you haven't seen it, it's on the screen right now. But now let's okay. uh, let's do a Doctor Who <laughs> podcast instead because that's kind of what we're here for. Okay, I, I can do that. So, courtesy of Cat, we've got the Doctor Who TV movie. Yay! Cat, you shouldn't have. No, really, you shouldn't have. Well, it's too bad. I did. You're welcome. And to talk hey. about the TV movie, this abomination unto God, I have my two usual co-hosts. I need a moment. Hang on. <laughs> right, there's my moment. There's my moment. Firstly, to my virtual left, he's half so human on his side. that was the War Doctor's moment. Cats talked over me through that shit. God damn it. <laughs> 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 Alright, go ahead, go ahead. He's half you on his mother's side. It's frisky in fun though. <laughs> <laughs> this 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 begs the question as to what I am on my father's side. I would rather not go into that. <laughs> Awkward sciences are fun. Awkward sciences are fun. <laughs> <laughs> and to my virtual right, she always dresses for the occasion, but sometimes interrupts me like an idiot. It's cat. Hey, which is funny because I'm currently wearing pajamas. So hey, you always dress for the occasion. Yeah. Not well, do shit today. We have a uh, interesting cultural artifact here. <laughs> is that what you call it? An interesting cultural artifact. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's well, a word for it. Yeah. So I, I, I feel, as the uh, resident uh, Anorak super fan, I should give a little context to the history of the TV movie ever so briefly. Doctor Who, the classic series, ended in late 1989, and it came back in the spring 2005 with Russell T. Davies and Eccleston and Billy Piper and all that. But in between... We had what's known as the Wilderness Years, and the TV movie helps divide the Wilderness Years into distinct eras, you know, seven and the leftovers of the Seventh Doctor Era and the Eighth Doctor Era, such as it was, because before the movie, we had uh, McCoy and, uh, you know, he's a... Uh, the show was off the air, people didn't know if it was coming back, because the BBC didn't say it was cancelled. They learned that lesson from Colin Baker's years. They just sort of put it on hiatus, and one year becomes two, three, four. Hey, wait a minute. Are we canceled? I think we're canceled. But all through that time, we had some interesting continuations, namely the books. Really neat novels. I've read a few. I really like the Paul Cornell ones. They're that perfect mix of, like, it's kind of like Doctor Who meets Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Just that same sort of weird, that 90s gonzo, mature, dreamlike quality to it with a hint of darkness. I, I really like Paul Cornell's work. But uh, in the meantime, a uh, producer in America named Phil Philip Siegel, who grew up watching the show in the UK, he really wanted to make a Doctor Who uh, continuation. And he worked for Amblin Entertainment at the time, which, uh, which is a... Uh, Steven Spielberg's company. But it's correct, yes. What. Yeah. So they had the, that name behind it, and there was all sorts of rumors going around through the 90s. Oh, Steven Spielberg wants to make a Doctor Who movie. So one thing leads to another. Negotiations happen here and there, and eventually Philip Siegel catches Sh the attention. Sells his soul to the devil. <laughs> well, known the as Fox. Yeah, basically. Uh, the person. The guy in charge of Fox's TV movie department says, oh, you've got the rights to Doctor Who. We should make a movie out of that. Which everyone jumped for joy, and then they were like, oh, wait a minute. We were contracted with the BBC to make a series, not a movie. So what they did, they hatched a deal where the TV movie would be considered a backdoor pilot, where if it did well, you, Fox could then option it to make a 
television series. An American television series. An so, American you know, television series. That would have gone well. <laughs> yes. Just let so, that silence stand there for a little bit. Yeah. Well, but in this timeline, uh, the TV movie did not do well. Well, it, it did okay yeah. in the UK. It did okay in the UK, as far as I'm aware, from the material people like generally. I believe it did that. fine in the UK. Yes. It was just like, oh hey, that old Doctor Who show is, is back and it's got a nice fresh coat of paint. It's pretty neat. It, it didn't really have people clamoring for um, any follow up hmm. to it, or. And but in America, where the real money mattered, uh, people didn't give a shit. And we never got a 90s Doctor Who series. Which is really so, sad because, you know, um, you know who owns Fox now, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, I know where you're Disney. going with this. <laughs> so that means technically Paul McGann is a Disney princess. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Well, I mean, he's got the hair for it. <laughs> this, is, this is my new hand headcanon. Paul McGann is a Disney princess. Fight me. Come well, down here and fight me! I swear, we don't have any problems. You make a good argument there. I, I, I we think, can go uh, on with that. We can go on with about the legacy of the TV movie a little later. But for now, let's actually talk about the uh, the uh, movie in question. Yeah, the nine, the and we have quite a lot to unpack of, here with the intro. <laughs> good. Which, to be fair, the, the intro tries to unpack a lot. Like, I just want you to put yourself in the shoes. Of like just an average American viewer, let's say, oh hey, I I live in um excuse I, I you, in what? I don't have to put it in any shoes. I am the average. It's almost like we have the average American viewer here right now. <laughs> Hi. Well, I I wouldn't say average because you know all about Doctor Who and shit. Um, but I would say that's a cultural appropriation. Excuse you. <laughs> Goodness me, I've been canceled. Whatever shall we do? It I'll starts. look in the mirror and worry about it later. But no, it it America doesn't really have a culture, so... Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, imagine just clueless American viewer just sitting down. They, say they like some sci-fi here or there. They watch a bit of Star Trek, maybe like a Star War. So they sit down and watch this Doctor Who thing. And what do they get immediately upon the episode, the, the movie? I they get Chipmunk Daleks. Chipmunk Daleks and exposition. Yay. And just ridiculous exposition that it doesn't make sense to the average viewer. And frankly, it doesn't make sense to us. No. No. Well, it does sum it rely up. on a, a heck of a lot of knowledge, um, which is good for the Doctor Who fans, but it's bad for the people that they wanted to bring in, which are new people, essentially. Yeah. I would argue it's not even they Chris Chibnalled it before Chris Chibnalled it. Yeah, oh God. I would say that it isn't even that great for the fans because it's like, as a fan, you're sitting there thinking, what the fuck are we talking about? What? <laughs> well, no, yeah, you're, you're still confused as a fan. It's like, But it's like, at the What's very the least, case? you know what a Dalek is. You know what a Time Lord is. They don't is. sound you know like the that. Master is. You know, don't sound no, like they that. Don't, they don't sound like that, but at the very least, you know who they are. If you're mm -hmm. just a random person walking in on, you know, to the TV room, and you're like, "Fuck is going on?" You, you don't, you don't expect to hear Alvin, Alvin, Alvin. Alvin, you've disgraced me for the last time. <laughs> well, you know, Paul McGann is a Disney princess. He needs his chipmunk pals to help him out with the day, so. <laughs> All right. There so, you go. So what's going on here in this ridiculous exposition intro is uh, the master has been put on trial by the Daleks and sure. is executed. Sure. Okay. And then, and then the Daleks have the doctor take the master's remains back to Gallifrey. Yeah. Um, no. Which, which uh, <laughs> makes... No. Let, let, let's just say that makes no fucking sense and, and move on. Yeah. The master, the day. master played by Gordon Tipple. Gordon Tipple. <laughs> Ten seconds. <laughs> I want, one wonders why why Big Finish haven't gotten five box sets out of this guy yet. Hmm. Well, I, I mean, they did ask the late uh, the guy who plays the master later on to do Big Finish audios, so there's that. 
Yeah, but he, I mean, he played the role for more than 10 seconds. Yeah, Be- a, Beavers, like Beavers, Jacoby, and now Sim. Mm-hmm. Plus Michelle Gomez. Mm-hmm. And another actor mm-hmm. I'm not going to mention because it will spoil what we're talking about later on that played the master. But, uh... yeah. Okay. But I do like the, uh, the way they arranged the theme music here. It's very grandiose. It's bombastic, isn't it? Bombastic. I really it's like nice. it. They you will really heard a sample of it. If you if you listen to this podcast, you will hear a sample of it for the introduction. It's really good. I would mm-hmm. implore you to try and find the whole, the whole Another thing. Another thing that's really absolutely spectacular, this TARDIS set. Yeah. Oh it's something. Um, I can't say it's something I like, but it's something. No, I love I, it. I, I, I love it, too. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan just because of how cluttered it seems. It seems like... Because, I, I, I mean, I can, I get it. The Doctor is a very eclectic person. But mm-hmm. even when it was the, per, the, the the older Doctors, the TARDIS, you know, the main room of the TARDIS was still pretty minimalistic. It wasn't, here's a whole shelf full of clocks. Yeah, I, I here's know. Here's a fucking wingback chair with the, a record player so he can listen to whatever opera he's listening to. But here's the thing. You know that I'm an ancient history graduate. I'm, I'm big into my history. So I'm a sick of a marble interiors. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it looks nice. I'm not a fan of the TARDIS console. That that part I really don't yeah, like. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that nice, much. But it, it just feels a little weird because it's like they shoved half of the production set for a Sherlock Holmes movie into there. <laughs> I will say, you know what's really nice, but this this has nothing to do with the quality of the movie other than the set's nice. It's really nice to listen to the Big Finish audios featuring Paul McGann. And imagining that TARDIS in your head as you listen. Yeah. That's that's that really adds to the charm of those, but that's that doesn't really have anything to do with the quality. But we're talking about the wrong doctor because we've got Sylvester McCoy back. Yeah. Holy shit. And he's got bozo hair. What the hell? <laughs> well, seven years oh. have passed between now and survival. And that's a very no, his, that's a very apt reference because this right? actually does follow on from survival. Well, you could argue it follows on from uh, the novels, but it, it doesn't really say one way or the other. S- survival is never mentioned well, specifically. I seen survival. Well, it's, it's, never, it's never mentioned specifically. Well, we might be able to fix that later. Uh, mm. It's never been specifically stated that it's survival, but it's survival. Also, Ace isn't here. Where There's no explanation for where Ace went on screen or anything. Uh, she hey. went back to her home planet um, with Poochie. <laughs> God. Every other week we reference that line, it feels like. Every other week. Well, I mean, it works. It works. What it doesn't works work. Every single time. Well, what what maybe doesn't work so much is uh the ghost snake master. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, sure. Um, this is 1996. It's a Fox BBC joint production. You'll tell me that's the best liquid metal that they could that, that they could afford. Like, it's for, for those who might be a little bit lost, the master was cremated. The doctor put the urn inside of a box and locked it. Thought that was good enough. The master did. It was not good enough. Something. Hashtag, hashtag good enough. <laughs> the doctor or the master did something to turn his ashes into goo, where he then cracked the box open somehow. You're just describing this. out of it. Even you just describing this is ridiculous. I, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make some sense of it, and it makes no sense whatsoever. The Master is now a big pile of goo that happens to be able to turn into a ghost snake. Also, I can't quite believe it's come to this. Uh, well, the very first shot we see of Sylvester McCoy... Mm-hmm. It's reflected in a mirror. Gotcha! Ah! <laughs> Doctor Who. Oh my God! You have got me. You've it's actually, I've Who actually found one you missed. <laughs> well, to be fair, there's a there's a lot in the movie. Yeah, but yeah, I know, but that's why I'm getting mine in now. <laughs> I'm I'm, sa- I'm saving mine for a bigger scene. I'm getting my scene. I'm getting my shit in now. And <laughs> yeah, honestly, if the movie was a little bit better, this would probably be Jerry's wet dream. There's mirrors everywhere. 
<laughs> I I do like the I do like the symbolism of, of the lots of clocks in the TARDIS and and maybe I'm, that's I'm, go, I'm going to say something really can't, I don't know if it's a good idea to talk about wet dreams while the master is currently a pile of goop. <laughs> well, to be fair, he does shove his big snake into someone's mouth without their permission. So. <laughs> oh God! I need a minute. Oh, oh. honey, I need a you're minute. bringing a knife to a gunfight, and I am firing. I need a minute. <laughs> Anyway, I, oh, well, we're going to get to fire in, in a bit. The first, uh, <laughs> the ghost snake master sabotages the TARDIS, and uh, shit's going out of control. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> Raniac, you want to talk about the interesting directorial choice that happens next, yeah, if so you should ever recover. That's... <laughs> Shut up. I think he actually needs a minute. <laughs> no, I'm all right, I'm all right. <laughs> 20 I mean, seconds is three... fine. So, um... Yeah, the, the, there's lots of clocks in the TARDIS. Is that symbolistic of, it, of him running out of time? I mean, he's reading the time machine for God's sake. Yeah, and the record, and the record that he's playing is singing a song about time. So it's just like it's a bit on the nose. And then, and then we cut okay, from. So, so I'm I'm going to uh, take this moment to just talk about something very quickly because this moment at, that you're talking about right now. Actually, is really a big part of this. So, how much do either of you know about American made-for-TV movies? Very little. Ah, uh, Columbo. There, it's almost a specific formula that, that American TV movies follow. Um, for one thing, it's very cinematic on the lowest budget that it could possibly do. Um... You know, that, that includes things like the hokey snake graphics and anything else that they can do. Like, uh, later on, they goo some people, and mm -hmm. that's supposed to be their quote-unquote death. Really? No I, budget. I really... Actually, come well, to think it, of it, it the only, like, a... You know what I mean. You know what the, I mean. Yeah, the only real, like, uh, American made-for-TV movies I know are the ones they made based on Stephen King books in the 90s. We don't talk about those around <laughs> Yeah. We don't talk about one around me. Either way, this here is the basic formula that all American TV movies that have some sort of action element, you know, something some, something big happens in it, whether it be a, a sports movie or a sci-fi or a fantasy. You see this a lot in the DCOM movies, the Disney original TV movies. Um, is It starts off with shoving as much exposition into your face as fucking possible. So, here's the Daleks. Frew! Here's the Daleks. Frew! And, you know, all that crap. Yeah. After that, it immediately starts with what is the situation. So, you don't really get time to get to learn about the character. It immediately goes into... Like, it'll, um, there's a popular... DCOM called the 13th year. It goes immediately from the kid as a baby to the kid as a 13-year-old. You get that kind of cut. Mm, okay. In this case, you go directly from the 7th Doctor, who is just a rambling, bumbling, you know, nobody knows what the heck he is, to Paul McGann, who doesn't even know who the hell he is. Which... Then you start to get into the action part, uh, where a villain or some sort of antagonist of some kind shows up. There's a big problem that shows up as well. In this case, it's the Doctor's amnesia and the Master. Mm -hmm. Then it gets into the climax part, where something major happens. Um, you know, Paul McGann gets captured, and all this other bad stuff happens. And then, all of a sudden, it gets straight to the end. And those five things happen as fast as they possibly can, because you only have so much time for these TV movies, if you also include commercials that happen in them. And that is the formula that always happens whenever it comes to American TV movies. That right. always happens. So this, this one pretty book. much follows it by the book. Right. Okay. okay. I see. I see. Yeah. So that's probably where some of the disconnect does come from is hmm. there's a lot of tropes in this like the doctor suddenly having a love interest that's very very common in american movies hmm. um you know the master being the master the way he is in this movie is yeah. pretty much a, a general tv antagonist 
you know, one it's just one of those things where there are a lot of tropes that come with the format, and that mm-hmm. doesn't really work with Doctor Who most of the time. So it's pretty obvious why this was so pan. Well, in that case, I'm rather surprised it, it did better in the UK. Probably well, because th- they actually knew who the fuck Doctor Who was. That's there. Yeah, that's exactly. It could it. be that. Yeah. It's just for you saying that this was a standard TV movie formula. <laughs> <laughs> you think it did? Yeah, but you also America. have the added, you have the added fact that nobody knows what Doctor Who really is here. Right. Some people may have watched it, but it's kind of like the the big anime boom. Nobody yeah, really um... watched anime except for very niche people. Yeah. And then yeah. once it started to become a little bit more mainstream, you know, you had Toonami where it had Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. As well as the four kids stuff. We won't talk about that. Well, that's a little uh, later than what you're talking about. I think. Well, it was still the 90s. Okay, yeah, late 90s. Yeah, but still, it still has the same formula where it was a very niche thing. Not a whole lot of people watched it. I don't even know if it aired on TV here. Like, Doctor Who before this was basically just, you might catch an old Tom Baker on PBS at 8 o'clock at night or some shit. But that, it, did that. Have its fan, it did have its fans in America, though, at the time. But like you said, yeah. it was like pre-Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon anime. So Tom, it's a very, it very it's a niche. Very, a very niche thing, like, you know. It's not Tom yeah, Baker's once, era in particular once... was broadcast in, in America because we got yeah. the infamous video pirate incident. Oh, yeah! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, so, but pretty much once the new series came out with Rose and everything, that's where people started to get a little bit more into it because... What ha- what's like the first thing that happens in Rose is a lot of action, right? A lot of action. The new Doctor is introduced in, in pretty bombastic fashion. Yeah. That kind of sounds like an American made-for-TV movie, doesn't it? A little bit, yeah. but Rose handles it better. Well, yeah. well Rose had yeah. the You Rose basically had the you follow the Rose as she gets introduced to the Doctor as well, so that makes it a little bit easier for people to digest. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, we we go from uh, symbolism of of running out of time to racial stereotypes. A bunch of teenagers, a bunch of Asian teenagers doing kung fu. Not stereotypical in the slightest. It is Chinatown in San Francisco, so... I know, but really... It's it's not perfect, but... Uh, this Listen. is also this is also pretty common of American TV movies is the stereotypes. And at least they, they cast yeah. actual Asian actors and didn't just yellow face some people. We are not referring <laughs> to that thing again. <laughs> I yeah. refuse. But again, this is one of those tropes. There was always the stereotypes. There was the nerdy kid. There was the Asian kid who knew kung fu or some sort of martial arts. There was the well, actually white these guys kid. are like a. Uh... These guys are like gang members. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're but in San Francisco. Still knows kung fu. Yeah, he does do. And, and then actual gang like, members show up with, with actual guns. This is a ridiculous scene because it's like they they're running away from a guy in the car, like a rival gang member or something. They run into an alley, and the guy drives off, and they're all like, "Yeah, woohoo! We showed them." And then four gang members just pop up from behind a bunch of trash. With machine, with machine guns. guns. <laughs> like, what Again, was it was Chinatown in San Francisco. And they the don't 90s. they don't take the time to shoot uh Chang. His name is Chang Lee. Oh, they, they Swiss cheese the fuck out of his buddies though. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, Chang manages to like get Well get, he he gets away something. because the Taurus appears around him. Oh, this is a really good scene. And I protects gotta say. him, and then like... Sylvester McCoy comes out and gets shot. Okay, okay let's yep. let's just back, let's back up a little bit here. I just want to praise the TARDIS materialization scene because I really like it. The way that things just rumble and you yeah, sort, n- slowly nice effects see. on that. And you know, on the on the nose thing of a, a like a billboard or something in the back alley that says "Visit London." By the way, you know that snake effect we had earlier with the master. Mm-hmm. This is where all the budget went was into making this. Scene. Yeah. Oh god. But yeah, this is a. Uh, what happens next is a little uh, odd. 
the doctor, the seventh doctor, mind you, get shell. Who in his <laughs> down. In, in his later incarnation, who in his later incarnation was a master manipulator, a plotter, twelve steps ahead, playing interdimensional chess with people's lives and emotions. He'll finish it enough. Just let him get it out. Walks out the door without checking the scanner and gets shot. <laughs> yeah. So we could just let it with me saying he gets shot, but no, you had to you had to wax lyrical about it. Just uh, just, just let him, I just let him wax, have this. I wanted to wax lyrical about the irony of it all. Well, it's either irony or just they didn't give is a shit. This, is this a homage to the last time the doctor got shot? Which time no. Is that? The no, I can tell you right now it's not a homage the to Pertwee everything. Era. They just wanted to get the new doctor as soon as possible. Hmm. John Pertwee era. Shot? He got shot again. Again, again. I they think have it's to in his last formula. story. He didn't die of getting shot. He died no, he, he doesn't poison. die of getting shot, but you you hear a gunshot and go, "You no, no, you fall." He just falls over like he's been shot. Oh no! Oh, you're talking about the, the cliffhanger to his first story. Oh, that's his first one. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, he didn't get shot. He just he just passed out. That was well, the well you heard gun, guns go off yeah. and. Then- the he cliffhanger was meant to make you think, oh no, Doctor Who's been shot, but actually he just killed over there. Yes. And the, you know, besides the point. So seven so seven has been shot, and uh the and Chang Lee, the guy the gang member guy who survived, uh, calls him an ambulance, which he cares, I guess. Well I wouldn't to be fair, the doctor did technically quote unquote save his life. Yes, he did. Okay, well that's that's good enough. And you know, so, if he didn't do that, then it would be dishonoring you, dishonoring your cow. Oh God! So on. Cat, I know, I know, you're making the Disney. After whom? The reference Who machine on. strikes again. But I don't know then, but then, about. but to get to make things even worse, the Seventh Doctor now has to face uh, a danger more threatening than anything he's ever faced, and that's privatized healthcare. <laughs> A oh. <laughs> little bit yeah. too on the nose there, buddy. A little bit too on the nose. That that actually hurt. Oh. Oh, God. But, um, yeah, uh, it goes well. I, unfortunately, I, mean, I can't get it seen because it's, it's too expensive. <laughs> oh, jeez. The surgery goes well. Oh, yeah. oh the surgery. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, yeah... The guy in the ambulance, this this no name guy who they a- added in a bit part, that's actually a the brother of Julia Roberts playing the ambulance attendant. Thing. Yeah, wow. what a what a nice cameo for Eric Roberts. Oh wait. <laughs> oh oh, <laughs> hang on a second. Yeah, but you know, Chang Lee just forges something or other for the form to pay for this guy's health care or whatever. But and that leads us to getting the doctor into surgery and calling the cardiologist. And then we meet Grace. Yeah. Um, who has inexplicably decided on a night that she's on call to go to the opera. In the she may not gown. have been on call and that she was called as an emergency. That can't No, happen. she was on call. She was on call the entire time. In that case, this she's an idiot. This is another common trope in American TV shows that are medical shows. It is. Which yeah. I will say one thing for this. The scenes where they're doing the medical stuff, um, not necessarily before Grace comes in, but afterwards where she's scrubbing up and everything, mm-hmm. minus the gown, it's actually pretty accurate to what happens in real life. Yeah, now, her, her being fitted okay. for fitted with her mask while she's on the phone is a very funny moment. It's, that's actually what happens, because as soon as you, you wash your hands, you are not allowed to touch anything whatsoever. Yeah. You can't touch your mask, that's why they put it on her. You can't touch your gown to put that on. That's why they put that on for her. And when the doctor tugs down her mask later, somebody else adjusts it for her because it's she a, has to keep her It's hands a bit down. on the nose for this year, given the pandemic thing, but... Yeah. But, but also, that's also, actually what happens. That's yes. actually what happens when people go into surgery. You're absolutely someone right. Did, and uh, and I, commend, I commend Doctor Who for that, at least. It's that's not, the not just, it's not just US television as well. Had. UK television does this trope as well. Um, Inspector Moores, which was a very good um, UK cop show, uh, detective drama. Uh, there's an episode of that where the chief pathologist and Morse have both been to the opera and they get called out to a murder while still at the mm. opera. Wild. So he turns out in a, in, a, in a dinner jacket and bow tie and she turns up in a full evening dress. 
essentially this essentially what happens with being on call it means that you can go about your normal everyday life Mm -hmm. um which includes you could go to a movie you could go to a show whatever you want to do but if you're on call that means that when they call you you go and of course you're not allowed to drink any sort of alcohol or take drugs yeah yeah my my sister's paramedic so i know a lot of this too yeah so then you know well, in yeah. that case, I'd just like to thank you. When she's on call, it's like, she can, yeah. So I don't think that she, she's not really an opera fan, but I don't really think she would do anything like big like that. Lavish night on the town when you're on call. It's like, no, well. No, well, of course not. She, she's, she's, yeah. she's not a fictional character. She's not a fictional character. She exists. So. Also, Grace's boyfriend is pretty <laughs> unreasonable. Like, oh, you ducked out of the opera when you were on call. I'm breaking up with you for this. Again, yeah. though, that's a common trope in yeah. American TV and movies, is where mm. oh no, this person has a boy slash girlfriend. We better get rid of them so that he they doesn't can even get lines. The main hero. Oh, wait, is I mean, is that it? I mean, y'all, you can just make her single if you want her to smooch the doctor. No, 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 she has, it has to be shown that she was in a monogam whatever she was in a relationship with someone and then they broke up because the other person was a dick yeah she can't be the dick it has, it, to, be it has to be shown that she's on the rebound she's not really yes. yeah there's nothing really here about her being a dick like she was on call she had to come in i think the implication is that he's well, the no, dick. yeah that's the point that's the point it shows that the other person is the dick they yeah. don't deserve her <sighs> obviously she should be with this person instead yeah which would be the doctor in this case Anyway, anyway the, now... the surgery goes really well. Here, here, well, here's a here's a good question for you, Frez. Mm-hmm. Did you watch National Treasure Two? Is that the one where Nicolas Cage kidnapped the, the president? That's the that's the first first one. one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't, then let's I didn't put it see this National way: I, I think in the, they had this in the first one too. Uh, wait a minute. Which which is the National Treasure with Harris in it? Who who cares at this point? But. It, it, I think in National Treasure 1, he knew the lady who worked with the Declaration of Independence, right? Yes. Okay. They used to be in a relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Did they... And they just broke up for, like, some weird, you know, nondescript reason. They weren't communicating or something like that, right? Right. But magically, during the course of the movie, of course they fall in love again. I mean, and then in the Cage. second movie, and then the second movie, they broke up to get oh, back together God. again. Oh, for God's sake. Yeah. I mean, I mean, That's... to be fair, it's Nick, it's Nick Cage. <laughs> yeah, but this is a common thing with action movies too. Is right. and romantic comedies. Now that I think about it, but <laughs> there's always a relationship at the beginning that got broken up, so that frees the main hero and the main heroine, so that they could get together. And by the end of the movie, they have a big kiss or whatever, and their partnership or whatever. That's just a common ass trope. You see it all the time. I got you. So in our next scene, the doctors fuck up horribly and murder the doctor. Yeah. Yep. The surgery goes well. Yeah. It we goes so well. Opera. It goes we so well. Playing. Part of the equipment is left in him, stuck in him. We're even yep. like playing opera during the operation. Another stem that trope. That actually does happen. That does happen. They do that. That happens in real life. Yeah, that can happen right. in real life, particularly brain okay. surgery. Yeah. Oh no, it does happen in real life. The surgeon gets but the even now, uh, what music they play. Yeah. But even now, as a uh, the seventh doctor like wakes up and is like, "Oh shit, don't you you idiots! I'm not a human being. Don't Why? cut me open." They he he essentially flatlines on the on the operating table. There's this whole thing about t- his two hearts. Is it a double exposure on the X-ray? Mm-hmm. Well, no, it isn't, but that's what they think it is. So, with the yeah. thing stuck in him, uh, it actually kills him. Uh, he goes before, into before, cardiac arrest. Before because, that, I just want to mention that uh, as he's saying, oh my god, holy shit, he's talking about needing an atomic clock, which uh, is interesting, considering that the problem... Well, that's what I'm thinking. Like, I think the problem with the TARDIS right now is the timing... Yeah, but there's a function. bigger pro- but there's a bigger problem that the master causes later that the doctor yeah. seems to also fix with his clock thing. I'm not yeah. sure how this works. I think you, yeah. you can basically um, attribute it to the little uh, quite before the big one. 
right, right, right. The little ripple before we, we the, the also massive put tremor. in that uh, during the scenes before we meet Grace, um, basically the doctor's being wheeled on the gurney through to the uh, operating ward. But in a cut with this, we keep going back to the ambulance where we can see the master snake um, essentially crawling through over to a jacket and sliding into that jacket uh, of the paramedic who was in the... Um, oh, yeah, the Eric Roberts cameo paramedic. Yes, yeah, okay. Bruce. Yeah. yeah. But, oh, yeah, but I should mention that as the opera singer uh, on whatever song it is, Madam Butterfly, I think it is, uh, hits her... I don't know the musical term, so I'm going to call it crescendo. High note. High note. Crescendo. High note. Yeah. I, I was going to call it crescendo. As she hits the crescendo, we get the seventh doctor screaming in agony. Yeah, and also she... they they shook him with a defibrillator when he flatlines. Yep. yep. And it actually succeeds. They they zap him. He wakes up. He screams. They zap him again. <laughs> Dumb shit. You've just brought him back to life. And, and he so dies. the master manipulator dies because of a bunch of incompetence out of his control. Yeah. The irony really is incompetent delicious. incompetent because you're not supposed to use a defibrillator like that, but I have no. obviously been watching way too many doctors on YouTube, so let's move on. As far as I know, the minute the patient responds to the shock, you don't use it again. Yeah. Because another shock. Plus, you're only not- supposed to use it in very specific uh, times, and I'm pretty sure the heart stopping is not one of them. Another another shock, having jump start the heart with an electric shock. Another one could knock it out again. <laughs> so, just shotgunning through real quick. Uh, Grace tells Chang Lee, who stuck around for some reason after this, because the plot demanded it. Because the plot demanded it. He finds out that the guy died, and he's like, oh, that's too bad. Is this his stuff? I can't let you leave with this stuff until I know who you are. Uh, and bye! Just <laughs> and, and Grace yells, stop that gun! That, I mean, stop that man! <laughs> I wish you should have stopped that gun, then that would have been a great throwback. No, um, I, actually, I actually wrote that in my notes, because I knew I Because she's in a dress, she can't chase after him. Mm-hmm. Again, a trope. <clears throat> And then we get, well, a little bit of thematic mirroring. Oh, God. Because, uh, well, the Master and the Doctor get new incarnations. They do, That's but before that, time. we meet these two morticians who are entirely too much. Which which is funny, because I remember the... the Very the, realistic. The, the large one, I remember, actually, from another Fox show. You, any of you remember Mad TV? No. In the 90s? Mm-hmm. No. It, it, was like, it was like Fox's answer to Saturday Night Live. Uh, I, don't I, remember, know I, I, I watched that in the 90s a lot. I remember him on it. I know his character. I know his character says inappropriate things like John Doe on the toe and party on at the corpse. Yeah, yeah. Someone's been watching too much film, Ted. Yeah. Again, though, that, that's pretty realistic because morticians have a shit job and they have to keep the humor somewhere or else they're going to remain well, sane. They, get, they got a morbid sense of humor. Yeah. There's, there's the but, difference between a morbid <clears throat> sense of humor and just being a dick. Anyway, so let's They're focus dead. On. What are they going to do? Complain? You've never heard of respect. <laughs> you've never heard of respect for the dead. Well, well. I've heard of respect for the dead, but again, they're in a private room. Do you really think they're going to be nice to them? Fair enough. Well, the, the, the soon to be imminently regenerated. Before that, as Kat said, uh, Eric Roberts, our nice little cameo, is snoring in bed, just having a snooze. <laughs> And the ghost snake master decides to jump down his throat and take his body for a ride. I didn't think his jaw could open that wide. (laughs) That's what she said. (laughs) And meanwhile, in another bit of just absolute on the nose thematic living. Fifteen foot foot python down throat. (laughs) In a in a bit of just so on the nose mirroring. uh, Florida man chokes on snake. The (laughs) the uh, obnoxious mortician guy you mentioned is just sitting there on the late shift with a bowl of popcorn watching Frankenstein. Yeah. And I have to say, I have to say, and we have mentioned, by the way, the story takes place New Year's Eve 1999. Yes. What in the shit kind of TV station is playing Frankenstein on New Year's Eve at like 2 in the morning? Uh, The horror channel, I don't know. Hey, 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 hey. They wanted to go ahead and get in early with the new body, new me thing. I get, yeah, yeah. I, I get the thematic mirroring thing, but like, 
that's weird. <laughs> it's like you'd think that yeah, at New Year's, it's a, while you'd while think Frankenstein is being watched then by this way. fat mortician, uh, the doctor is regenerating, but it looks like he's experiencing a quickening from Highlander. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me it doesn't. The quickening. Tell me it doesn't. I, listen, I've only seen the first Highlander. <laughs> I have Which, seen so okay. many of the Highlanders. Save me. Well, if every time in the first film that a, a, an immortal gets beheaded, there's this sort of flash of electricity coming oh, out of their oh, body. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That shit. Hey, cat. Hey, cat. Yeah. The planet's yeah. waste. Did... I hate you. <laughs> Love you, too. <laughs> Uh, Ramirez, Ramirez the I'm Egyptian. Going, I'm going to ship a fuck ton of eggplants directly to your house. Ramirez the Egyptian, who has a Scottish accent. Oh, yeah. From space! If I admit that that's because he's, he's played by Sean Connery, and every character Sean Connery plays has a ah! Scottish accent. Anyway, uh, Seventh ah! Doctor has regenerated, and the Eighth Doctor immediately beats a door down. The effects are terrible on the regeneration, by the way. They're... Look, look, yeah. he wants to be where the people are. He he wants to see them <laughs> dancing. God damn. As, as, as Kat rightly pointed out earlier, all the budget went into the TARDIS. so many of these. The TARDIS <laughs> rematerialization, and that means that there's no budget for a good regeneration. So now we have a very confused Palm again who... Has oh, wait, 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 wait. Before, before we do that, can we please talk about those effects on, on Sylvester McCoy's face to change him into Paul McGann? Yeah, I that's, just said that's, the regeneration a, it was terrible. Yeah. I know, but you didn't go deep into it. That was about to, and then Jerry interrupted morphin. me. That's some <laughs> 90s ass face morphin, I tell you. Jerry cut that's me sick. off. I know, oh. that's why I went back to it. Yeah, that's some 90s ass face morphin, is right. It is the funniest it's shit. Like his, it's like his it's jaw like, is contorting. What the hell is that? I'm 95% sure it's claymation, which was huge then. <laughs> that would make sense. God. He so wants he to be he... Sledgehammer. Oh <laughs> my god. <laughs> Why don't you have a shit? That's a, hey, listen. Don't, don't knock Peter Gabriel. He's banging. I'm not knocking him. Oh, no, I love Peter Gabriel. I'm referencing him. There's a difference. <coughs> we dig a nice little bit where he's pounding on the door. The door gets knocked over. And out waddles Paul McGann with his wonderful flowing locks. He's wearing a white gown. <laughs> Which I should, I should mention, by the way, uh, that's a wig. Yeah. I know. It is? Yeah. That's a wig. He usually has shorter hair than that. Ah, oh, I feel cheated now. Yeah, um, he, mm. he walks out with his wig and his white gown. The politician immediately thinks that the second coming of Jesus has emerged and he faints. I mean, he's coming out in a shroud as, yeah. after having come back from the dead. <laughs> and then we get the most melodramatic thing of Paul McGann's entire performance. Oh, wait, are you talking about him him or the mortician? No, well, the mortician's out on the floor, out cold oh at this my point. Oh, God! Yeah. Oh yeah. I think he's this talking about the mirror bit. I'm talking about the mirror bit. Yeah. Well, before we the get to the mirror part, bit, for the um, most part, Paul McGann's performance is quite grounded. There's a touch of goofiness to it, but it's quite grounded. Apart from this line. Apart from this bit, yeah. So he wanders through the hospital. It somehow enters fucking Silent Hill. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an abandoned wing of the hospital. The roof torn open and shards. You're, of you're right, and I hate that you're raining. right. Ugh. What in the fuck? This exists only to show Paul McGann looking at his face in a bunch of broken mirrors. And there's seven mirrors, by the way, because seven incarnations of the Doctor. Yeah. And then and he, he sees the mirrors. Of broken mirrors, so Doctor Who mirror alert, by the way. That's yeah, I know. I I know that's the one I'm saving for you. I'm nice like that. And he gets, he gets on his knees. And as the thunder roars, he reaches his hands out like he's in the end of the Shawshank Redemption <laughs> and just screams, Who am I? With 90s echo reverberation effects on every word. <laughs> oh, yep. jeez. So. <clears throat> we, we, then, we then get a nice bit where um, Grace is, is being uh, talked to by the hospital administrator, who is a dick. Well, before, that, before that, we have some stuff. We have some. Stuff oh there. yes, we have some Bruce stuff, and we have a uh, and we have yeah. an, a, an interesting trope in Doctor Who. For the second of three times, 
the doctor nicks his new outfit from a hospital. Mm. Yeah. Previously done by John Perry. And later done and by Matt Smith. La- yeah, I was going to say, later done by Matt Smith. Mm. Also done later by Matt Fucking revving a motorcycle like you're a goddamn lunatic. I didn't hear anything, so... I thought that was you doing a motorcycle revving voice. I, yeah. Well, I heard it. That was why I was making fun of it. Keep it going. Three, keep it going. It's, it's fine. Three, it's, it's, two, one. And yeah, he, uh... Matt Smith also did it later. In the but then we cut to the master, who is... Yeah, drop the gimmick. Eric Roberts is now the master in the TV movie. And, you know, it's just a standard scene. His wife wakes up and he's like, I'm still getting used to this new body. Yeah, and she thinks he's joking. Which leads to the, which leads to the hammy line where she's go back to bed, honey. My name is not honey. Well, what would you like me to call you then? <laughs> Master will do. <laughs> and, of course, she immediately gets turned on because it's a 90s movie. Yeah. And, and you know, then, and then he then, thinks then she, that she gets turned off permanently. Well, oh, yeah. he gets a little too into the autoerotic aphasiation. I was just about, I was just about to make that gag. I'm, I'm glad we're on the Don't same page. Don't put it for the second time, please. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, yeah, also he's like green snake well, eyes just now. be careful. Don't choke on air because we know the master's into that. So- <laughs> okay, now you can talk about green. Now that we've hit that. So the master's eyes are glowing green, as you as you rightly mentioned, and this is the bit. This is the the, the leftover from survival, because really? when the master was was stranded on the uh, on the cat planet, cat planet, cat planet, planet of the cats. God damn it, Rauka! Uh, <laughs> oh my god! When, when he was stranded on the planet of the cheetah people, mm-hmm. I, I can't help it. When I when I said it was cat planet, it just also creates into that long spiel. Uh-huh. And I have to sort of like hit myself to stop myself from from doing it. Um, yeah, the planet of the Cheetah People. He was left with the curse of the Cheetah People at the end of Survival, which Kat hasn't seen yet. So spoilers. Sorry about that. Uh, I mean, we're watching a movie after. Like, so, the, year but they never mention they, they never mention Survival at all in this in this thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's what that's all about. But then he just his hand just shoots out, grabs Bruce's wife by the throat, and strangles her to death. Yep. What? The master killing somebody? Why I never. Now, now this Shot. this this uh, neck murder this this murder is is sort of framed in a way that is not too explicit. Not going to yeah. be the case well, yeah, later on. It's a TV movie. Yeah, which makes the other one more. Later on, genuinely shocking. Uh-huh. But, um, yeah, so his wife is dead. Um, we get back to Grace now. Uh, the doctor is, is waiting in the uh, in the admissions ward. Still got the tag on his toe, which is a nice touch. And Grace runs into the <laughs> world's dickest um, hospital administrator. Which, yeah. this is a scene. Again, before. another trope. It's another mm-hmm. trope. This is very common whenever it comes to medical dramas. Is you always have that one guy who wants to make sure that the hospital stays safe. We can't have anything bad happen to the hospital, even at the expense of other people. Or the terrorists win. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, to that end, uh, to that end, he burns the weird X-rays of the doctor, and, and it's like, oh, nothing happened here. Nothing. So everything's fine. Just gonna cover this shit yeah, up. Yeah, Grace's response is to quit. Yep. Yep. And then she finds um, Paul McGann in a car. So this scene is just wild. I mean, you got Paul McGann following Grace around, talking about, "Oh, we've known each other. I know you from somewhere." And she's like, "Uh, no." Well, again, they again. he walked with her once upon a dream. God damn it! <laughs> I told you, I've got a ton of these. I believe you, and I hate it. She's got an entire <laughs> checklist of references. She's not ready to use them, folks. We're going to be here yeah, all night. Like, leave, leave me the hell alone. Gets in her car. Gets ready to start it. And then the doctor starts screaming in her backseat. Because he's and, pulling uh, the probe out of himself. Yeah. Ah. Jesus Christ. Which brings back some of his memories. He, he's got amnesia. 
Oh my! He's got. I believe his explanation amnesia. was that he took too long to regenerate, so the amnesia is affecting yeah. him more. I mean, that in itself is controversial because they're That's not supposed hilarious. to be able to regenerate if they're fully dead. Yeah. And he flatlines. Regeneration is the process of cheating death for a time lord, not to come back from the dead. Timey wimey bullshit. Not to come back from the dead. Also, the anesthesia fucked with it, so who knows how that. They did say that he did say the anesthetic messed with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To be fair, he he kept popping up over and over again on the. So the, that's the enough to convince floor. Grace that hey, this guy is like the weirdo they were looking for. So she takes him back to her place, and meanwhile, we uh, suddenly switch gears, and the master is now decked out looking for John Connor. I, I mean, the doctor. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, I just realized the dude the um the mortuary dude, was his name Pete? Pete. Yeah. That's William Sasso. I said that. Yeah, he's, 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 the, he's the lemon guy. Oh my god, I didn't realize. Will Sasso, yeah. That's the guy from Mad TV I mentioned, yeah. No, it's the lemon guy. Yeah, he's he's more famous for being doing the lemon thing What's online. What's the lemon thing? I, what is oh that? my god, he doesn't know the lemon thing. I do not know the lemon thing. Please educate me. Where's the lemon thing? Out. We're we're like we're like we're like this. Yeah. Uh, continue on while I get it. Yeah, so, I, yeah I know what you're talking going, about. Yeah. So yeah, somehow we've gone full Terminator here. The master's all decked out in a leather jacket and sunglasses, and is asking about the doctor, and just casually peeling off his own decayed fingernail while he does it. Yeah, it's really yeah. fucking disgusting. And the the hospital receptionist just plays plays it off as him being a jokester. So apparently Bruce was into jokes. Mm-hmm. And he finds out that Chang Lee took the stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So we get this competition between really? Chang and the Master. That's yeah. it. <laughs> That's well, it. Lemon Vine. Well, be- well, before that, we get Grace and the Doctor in her place. When, which she gets home and she realizes her ex-boyfriend has immediately taken all his shit. What a dick. Which was fast, considering. <laughs> Which makes that that's fucking weird. It's just like you think like immediately like that's it. I'm done with you. Hello, Central Movers. Yes, I need to get all my shit out of here before 12 p.m. tomorrow. He also takes the sofa. What are we gonna hide behind now when this is scary? <laughs> Actually, it's not even 12 p.m. tomorrow because it's it, it's pretty much sort of like it's nighttime when the doctor gets shot. And mm-hmm. then it moves on tw- through the night, closer and closer to 12 a.m. Mm-hmm. So he managed to find someone to come pick up stuff from his house on New Year's Eve that close to 12 a.m. Fuck sakes. And get all of his shit out of there within only a couple of hours at most. This is a nice scene between Grace and uh, Eight because, you know, he's starting to get his memory back. He's being v- more doctorish, and once he mentions, you know, the whole regeneration thing, she's like, "Oh, I don't believe in that sort of crap. That's bullshit. That's childish." And the doctor just responds, "But it was a childish dream which made you a doctor, wasn't it? The power to hold back death." It is a nice cool. scene, though. He's like talking about nice. composers. He talks mm-hmm. about this one painting and how the dude painted with all the colors. It's, of the it's wind. a nice scene, but if you if you put more than a minute moments for into it, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, oh yeah, that, oh, yeah. That. that shit. Yeah, he he didn't know who she was, and now he knows about her past and her future. This is a weird thing they do in this movie. Yeah, he he's got like I'm like, powers, which that's not really how that works. But I no. mean, it is sort of a semi reboot pilot for another show. So in this continuity, he very well. But who the fuck? While this is going on, the Doctor's uh, talking to his new friend. The Master has also made a new friend. Which, which is what? Because Chang Lee, he finds a bunch of stuff. He, he's a sonic screwdriver, a yo-yo, a watch, and a weird key thing, which he instinctively knows to take to that weird blue box that saved him, and unlock it to hop inside the TARDIS. And we do the usual, what the fuck? It's bigger on the inside. <laughs> it's in the oh, someone is waiting for him. It's, it's the master. It's the master. He somehow got into the lock TARDIS. Well, here's the thing. Uh, later in the movie, we find the secret. There's a second key above the. Yeah, uh, but here's the thing. He put it back then. Uh, he put it back then. That's the. He put he, it back. Uh, so he didn't know he'd been in there. 
So either the master put it back or this makes no goddamn sense. Take your pick. Yeah. Alternatively, I've got an explanation. He's the master. <laughs> he escaped. To be fair, he, he, we do see what he wears later on, so I, I'm more inclined to believe that he doesn't. Do he, that. he opened the door. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so he gives a little speech with Chang Li, and he's lying through his teeth about the doctor having stolen all his bodies and shit. And I really like this this cute line. It's like, the doctor used my body to commit unspeakable crimes. Like what? Genghis Khan. What about him? That was him. Yeah. <laughs> this is actually quite an interesting little um, concept. Mm-hmm. The master trying to convince someone that the doctor is the evil one and not him. Yeah. It's just a shame it wasn't <laughs> used, it was used for, it wasn't used for a better thing than this. <laughs> yeah. Has he ever at all tried this? Oh, well, um, I'm thinking about well, the big finish. That, that's the monk. Um, I'm, thi- I'm thinking of I'm thinking of a story from the Pertwee years called Colony in Space. Well, well, it's not really evil, but it's just uh, the master is masquerading as like an adjudicator, and nobody believes the doctor that he's actually an evil guy. Yeah, there's a whole yeah, there's a whole bunch. There's a couple of stories where the master is pretending to be someone in authority and has enough like forged documents to pass it off to make the doctor look like the weirdo. Yeah. But never I, one where he says outright that the doctor is evil. No, I don't think so, no. Not off the top of my head. And, yeah. um, orig- the, the master tries to hypnotize Chang. It doesn't last very long, but it wouldn't be the master without, without hypnosis. He really, he only really does it to get back the, like, key. And- yeah, and then he bribes him with these two bags of gold. Which, yeah. Gold dust. Gold dust. Hmm. Which I can't imagine is very easy to sell when you're a member of a pseudo gang. Hmm. Well, this leads us to it. We don't know a, if he actually is in a gang. This leads us to a really, really nice scene with Grace and the Doctor. They're walking through the park, and the Doctor suddenly remembers a night on Gallifrey about a meteor shower and stuff. Colors, lights, dancing in the sky. And then he just goes, These shoes! They fit perfectly. It's yeah. just really cute. I do like that. It's Which like it's some racing together at this point. Which is very doctorish, you know, mile a minute fast. Yeah. But this, then unfortunately this leads us to a bit of a weird issue. We enter the cloister room with the Eye of Harmony, which hey. Moffat later retconned as like a star going supernova in the heart of TARDIS or something. But this is just a big glowy thing. Yeah. And this is where we get some weird bullshit that doesn't make sense. So most of this TV movie is just sort of, you know, you can dismiss it or you can enjoy it. It's, it's nothing particularly major in, into the uh, series canon. Apart from obviously <laughs> Doctor Becoming Paul McGann. This thing has been debated for years. This thing fucking... De- I'm going to I'm gonna level with you. This... I think I know why this is here and it has nothing to do with canon of anything. I think I also know what this is here. Yeah. There was when they were trying to get the movie off the ground, they had a guy they had a guy create like uh, you know, a lore a bit of lore and another premise for the series and whatnot, which is the doctor who was the half brother of the master traveling around bullshit. And the doctor was a half human in this one. So yeah, I just gave it away. The thing we're talking about is half human well, I mean, I gave it away in the introduction, so that's fine. But um, but yeah, but this is just in the TV movie we got. This has absolutely no bearing on anything. That has. the only thing it has a little bit of a bearing on is is the Eye of Harmony. Yeah, but the Doctor doesn't really do anything. The idea it. is that the Doctor, and the Doctor, and not the Master, can open it because he he's half human. The Master is, which, is pure Time Lord, which. So he can't open it. No so the master just takes Chang's head and yeah. opens it. Yeah, basically the Eye of Harmony needs a human eye to be able to open it, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but okay. And really won't well with ten minutes to go. But but yeah, like uh, here's the thing about it. It's from like the first draft of a previous thing or whatever. I'm pretty sure the only reason it exists 
because some executive at Fox or the BBC or somewhere liked it because one of the big problems with this movie and the people behind it have sort of admitted it on the special features and whatnot is that there were too many cooks adding to the broth. It was the movie like the BBC wanted this. Fox wanted that. This executive wanted this. This executive oh. wanted that. Oh, sweetheart. Welcome to the American movie development teams. I give you 97% of Royale with five directors. Oh, my Jesus Christ. Now, that's too many cuts spoiling the broth. Yeah, that, that's yeah. that's basically what I think is going on here. Somebody somewhere in the pipeline who was putting a great deal of money in the project, like the half-human thing, was like, you got to keep that. No, keep that in, really. Keep that in. That's, that's my condition for giving you $250,000. Keep that shit in. <laughs> this is basically the Qatar is now white version of things <laughs> in the uh, Doctor Who universe. Oh, no. I'm still mad about that. An another, um... The interpretive challenge I have is that maybe the, the reason why the half-human thing is in here is... I got the impression, and you've told me this is actually <laughs> wrong now, but I got the impression this script was written by somebody who knew vaguely what Doctor Who was, had maybe watched a few episodes of the show, and just wrote the script. I'm not sure. About and you've that told me that's not guy. the case. That the guy was an actual, actually was a fan. I, I don't. Honestly, from my point of view, it was kind of obvious that they knew what the heck they were talking about. Like, it felt like someone had seen. Well, I, who I do know this, that the, well, the guy who produced it and the guy who wrote it are things. I do know the novelization of, the, of this TV movie and the TV movie don't quite match up. For example, the three gang members at the beginning with Chang, one of them's a girl in the in the novelization. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, maybe there was like a, a miscommunication there or something. But uh, yeah, the half human thing has been debated for decades by fans. They don't like it. And I mean, especially with Chibnall now, that's completely out of fucking... Part of the reason why why the, the hybrid thing was so sort of controversial and so talked about is that people thought, oh no, is Moffat really going to do the half-human on his mother's side he thing? Even, he even had a shielder hint at that in Hellbent, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Because well, I mean, he already made Paul McGann canon, so... Moffat's the master troll, that's why. Hmm. Yeah, but still. Anyway, uh, the, so the Doctor's half-human. This is a major revelation. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's the thing that this movie's done. But then opening the Eye of Harmony is... ...during Co can see through the Doctor's eyes, which... Sure. Oh, before, oh but before that, uh, the Doctor gives Grace a smooch, which was pretty controversial at the time. Like, what? <coughs> Doctor, <coughs> you kissing a that girl? Formula. I told That's you it's that formula. He he's yeah. got to have a love interest. Yeah, it's a formula. There you go. So there's your formula kick, kicked off. But uh, Cheryl's in a formula for success. The, opens, the master can see through the doctor's eyes, and then the doctor just goes exposition ape shit and shuts his eyes, and he's like in a panic. <laughs> it's the manic exposition machine. He's just talking about yeah. how many he's battling with. And Grace is so disturbed by this, she calls for an ambulance. <laughs> While Which she's doing to... that. He demonstrates that the world around them is falling apart by walking through her window. Yep, her window is made of like liquid glass now. So the explanation for this the is that the Eye of Harmony <laughs> is is changing reality. And it's going to suck planet Earth through Small it things at first, but it will eventually suck planet Earth directly into it and destroy everything. Mm -hmm. Her window is made of the master. <laughs> So now he needs to get an atomic clock. And lucky for him, the TV's on and happens to show that, hey, there's an atomic clock at this party. That's and this Grace institute. is freaking out at this point, so she now asks for two ambulances. She only gets one. And the one she gets is manned by Eric Roberts. Yeah. Now, I will say uh, here that uh, Eric Roberts has got a really nice evil laugh. Eric Roberts is just a big... He's having so much fun being a villain here. And I kind of can't hate the man for it. I, I yes, really like his master is very unlike like the master, but I, I would be lying if I said it wasn't enjoyable. Enjoy. Like, I like the scene in the ambulance where they're talking and Grace is just sassing the doctor about being a name dropper. And she's like, oh, Freud did have a field day with you. 
Yeah, I met him. Oh, yeah, sure. I bet you met Madame Curie, too. Oh, yeah. Does she kiss as good as you? And the master just interjects, as well as you. <laughs> yeah. I love that so much. I, would, I, would, I hope he had lived that, because that's great. <laughs> but, you know, shit goes south. The doctor realizes that the, the guy in the ambulance has fucking snake eyes. Ch- and there's a Chang master. is driving the ambulance. Chang doesn't know how to drive. Chang hits the brakes too fast. The master's sunglasses go flying off. Whoops. Yeah, it's a traffic jam because a uh, truck of chickens overturned. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then... Cat it sounds like some foul play. And then... Oh, cats. No. <sighs> no. I'm not apologizing. Please move on before it hurts. Punished venom snake. <laughs> uh, so a, a fight breaks out in the, in the ambulance. A scuffle. A skirmish, if you will. Mm-hmm. Between the master and the doctor. And the master does something quite disgusting. He hucks a loogie on Grace's arm. And it burns her. About to say the same thing. Yuck. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we've done it again. What have we done? The doctor uses a fire stick, which is to subdue the master. Oh my god. How do we keep doing this? How? Amazing. Well, this leads to uh, an action scene, such as it is. We also get um, a a throwback to an old doctor. (laughs) So they get out of the ambulance. Um, There's a police officer there on a motorcycle. He wants to arrest them. I Uh, I love Grace's line as the doctor's doing shit. She's like, stop, he's British. Yeah, he he reaches into his pocket. The, The guy thinks he's pulling a gun. But he's actually pulling a jelly baby. Which, search me where he got that. He gives him a jelly baby and then grabs the guy's gun and points it at himself. And Grace well, is to like... Be fair, to be fair, at one point in the hospital, we do see him open up a locker where the fourth doctor's scarf is in there. So maybe he stole the fourth doctor's jelly Not baby. Not the fourth doctor, but a scarf like the fourth doctor's. Okay, that raises some interesting. Okay, so the it's curator symbolism having... again. It's it's sort of a it's sort of an Easter egg. It doesn't matter, but at this point, you know, Grace, Tell me takes, the bullshit. Gun. Grace yeah. takes the gun from the doctor. It's like, please give me the gun, and she takes it and shoots the motorcycle. It's like, all right, give me the key. <laughs> yeah, and we have ourselves a merry little car chase. With the doctor and Grace on the motorcycle, and uh, the master and Chang with chasing. Yeah, which, and one of my favorite some one of my favorite lines. Um, lines of dialogue in the entire thing. <laughs> So the master is being goofy, and Chang says to him, man, you kill me. He goes, you want me to kill you? <laughs> no, 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 you you make me laugh. Oh, you, you forgot you forgot another great line where, get after them. I can't. We're in a traffic jam. This We're is in an, an ambulance. ambulance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Everyone's having so much fun. <laughs> so we get yeah. ourselves in the Nice, you know, car chase, which I'm sure people in Britain complain about. Oh, they got the car chase, Doctor Who. They're making it like a big American. But, you know, you look at the John Pertwee, and half the time he's on a motorbike or a quad or something. Yeah. Or like a horror crap. Like, wait, wait, I need to stop um, for just May one I second. point to the entirety of Bessie? Y'all, have you seen the Who-mobile? <laughs> you mean Bessie? No, actually, no. I have seen the Whomobile because the I remember wa- seeing one whenever. I, 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 I hang on, hang on. I need a good picture. The, 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 the Whomobile what now? Uh, okay, here we are. Here's the Whomobile. We're, the, we're, I'm sorry to be torn, but uh, the Whomobile. <laughs> what the actual this, fuck? This well, this this is like a toy version, but this is an actual fucking like hover. Hovercraft car thing that the third doctor drove in, and John Perkins what? owned it. It was a the working car. Actual fuck. The Who Mobile. He owned it. He owned it. That is amazing. We we, we know where it was road from. legal and everything. We know Very we know where the Simpsons got their inspiration for that episode where Homer designs a car called the Homer. Okay, oh now God. I'm ninety five percent sure that man is playing Galaga. <laughs> Let's uh, let's get back on track. I just needed. To, when else am I going to talk about? 
Uh, that that's amazing. Well, I, I don't, I don't mind. Oh I don't. God. No, no. J- John Perch running an F zero car. That's that's worth interrupting the podcast for. Uh. So the doctor and Grace make it to the inst- but the ambulance has beaten them there because Chang Lee, the doctor, I guess. Yeah. And we get some fun scenes. With the doctor and Grace at this shindig. We get the half human thing iterated again, but distraction so the doctor can steal this guy's badge and get up to a thing and. Uh, Take the battery out of the beryllium atomic clock or whatever. He takes a thing out of the big thing and then they go to run away to the other thing. Actually, this leads to a. F- Hang on. Script line got me. I just noted it. Oh, there it is. Okay, let me just go down and find it. Da 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 da. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and so once the doctor like pulls the thing out, he says, uh, see, I told you it was small. What is it they say? Yes, they say it on my planet, too. <laughs> I made a dick joke! Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and then uh, to distract the, uh, the the guy that's created the atomic clock, because they, <laughs> oh, there's a great bit with a guard. <laughs> yeah. And Where again, the, the, the they're trying to get to the clock, and he just does not let them in. That's oh, all. Yeah, that. And there's another guard that tries to stop him, but there's more precognition stuff where he's like, answer the second question and test not. And he's like, can I see what's in your hand? The doctor opens his hand, and it's, it's a jelly, jelly baby. baby. They run into more guards who are holding their guns, but they've been slimed by Slimer. I, I mean, the master. Mr. Freeze is back in town. <laughs> so they set off the fire alarm. They do a daring dive. Pose off a roof. So, and you know, we, we're heading out to uh, save the day and stop the uh, harmony from destroying the world. So, this leads to another funny scene where once they make it back to the target, cop on a motorbike. Oh, the motorcycle, him. yeah. And he's like, my brakes don't work. He drives into the target. You hear the siren fade out in the distance. <laughs> and then you hear, he comes right back out. Ah! Yeah, he's screaming as he drives up. <laughs> it's just like, which, try, it doesn't make any sense, but it's fucking funny. So. It's brilliant. No, There's some good gags. I, There's some really good gags. I will, not, uh, I will not have a go at that. That's great. It's like so, the Grandpa Simpson turning around. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the Doctor and Grace hop into the TARDIS and trying to do some stuff, and they actually hint at what's about to happen, because Grace is saying some technobabble bullshit. About yeah, dimensional transfers or whatever the fuck. Well, you can explain that by what's about to happen. Yeah. Because they're, yeah, no. they're about to fix this thing. The doctor asks Grace to hand him a hammer, and she smashes him over the head with it, because when the master spit his poison goop on her, I guess, he brainwashed her or possessed her or some bullshit. He either possessed her or put part of himself into... That sounded terrible. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Chang says that specifically that she's possessed. Yes, I think yeah. I think. I would say possessed. Yeah. Yeah. So that leads to our climax. Oh my god! In the cloister room where the doctor is hooked up and tied up to okay, a Okay, you can't say climax immediately after saying he put part of him in. <laughs> Just saying. This is the most suggestive episode of the podcast we've ever done. By the way, congratulations to that. I know. America. Yeah. America. But this leads to. Fuck yeah. Ab- the absolute campus, most glorious thing. The master yep. coming out in full Time Lord robe. Oh, coming yes. Down the this this makes all the other crap worth it. And the, his line delivery yep. is beautiful. He walks can, down the I'm stairs like, and he goes, I always dress for the occasion. For the occasion. I always dress for the occasion. It's the <laughs> little pause before the, for the occasion. <laughs> It's so, like, just camp and fun. I love it. Yeah. I can't not love it. He would but have been master- perfect as the master. He the master always makes thing. a big entrance, the master, and this is no different. Anyway, his grand plan is to use the Eye of Harmony to siphon the doctors for generations to his own body and bullshit. So he's got him shackled up into this big thing, which is funny. It's kind of funny in hindsight, because considering what we know now about the timeless children and all that... He would have been there for quite a fucking long time. Yeah. We don't talk about that. What is it, Russell and Sister, the Doctor in, in Hellbent? How many regenerations did we grant you? I've got all night. 
Yeah. I may have just watched that scene last night again. It's brilliant. But yeah, we're, we're kind of shotgunning through the climax. Big. Can we can we not call it the climax, please? The honestly, y'all climax. aren't missing much. We are literally hitting the, the high the, point. The doctor is movie. is is hooked to this machine. The missile is about to take the eye test from hell. Uh, it's, and then the master makes a mistake, goaded by the doctor, hmm. and he basically convinces Chang that actually, hang on a minute, maybe the master was the evil one all the t- all the all along. Hmm. So yeah. he, he he basically contradicts his own story. He says, you know, I spent all my lives, lives. I all my lives. lives, but now I'll take yours. It's like, uh, do you hear that? He said all his lives. And Chang believes this. Chang believes like, him, no, says, I'm wait, not going to help you anymore. And then, he's, and then the master says, well, you're the son I've always wanted, Lee. And breaks his fucking neck. And breaks his neck on camera. What? Yep. Oops. Yep. That's shocking. <laughs> but since he doesn't have a human eye, to eye harmony for his thing, because the doctor shut it to do thing before he got attacked. We forgot to mention that. Uh... You know, Grace is possessed. She can't do it. She doesn't got human eyes. Why can't he just take Chang's corpse, which his eyes are wide open, and put him into the... That's a good question. The answer is because then he wouldn't get to kiss Grace. They do it in Torchwood. Series 1 finale of Torchwood, Jack is shot dead. Obviously, he he gets better, but um, there's a a five-person retinal scan to to, uh, open the rift, and so... Mm -hmm. One of them shoots him, I forget which one, the team shoots him dead, and they say, we still got to do Jack, so they just put him on the machine. At least they didn't Simon Phoenix's eyeball out. That so would have been kind awful. of like that gag in Resolution, where, where the Dalek lady kills a guy and then uses his hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically. Um, anyway, back to the TV movie. But the, but the yeah. next step is metal as hell. I mean, it really did shock me that that was in a TV film. Yeah. Especially since they they kind of they they did the soft cut with the the wife being killed, Bruce's wife being strangled to death. Yeah, you just yeah. hear it, you don't really see it, and you see uh, Eric was reacting to it. But here, no, no, just take him in hand, crack, dead. I can tell you why, because it's violence against a woman. Uh, okay, that you know sense. that could be it. Makes sense to me. But violence against a teenager, hey, okay, killed a woman. <laughs> Anyway, the master get smooches Grace to suck out the possession, and then shoves no, her face into uh, the eye uh, of harmony. Th- bad yeah, way to put it. Bad way to put it. Shoves her face into the eye of harmony to open. Oh no! Eye of harmony open. It's the end of the fucking world, and the doctor's getting his regeneration s- sucked away. I will. I will <laughs> say, watching the master like jog his way up the stairs in that outfit is pretty funny, though. <laughs> Go- Governor Radcliffe from Pocahontas much? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Hang, hang on. I thought Cat was making the here. Gold. Beautiful gold. <laughs> oh my god almighty. In this case, it's regenerations, but beautiful regenerations. I, I, really like, I really like the way they build the tension here where they set the whole Aya Harmony end thing with the New Year's Eve countdown cutting across between the mortician I and like this apart from one thing. What's that? Why is the professor acting mm-hmm. so weirdly? Because he's a goofball. Is he drunk? Enough. Probably. It's because at one point, there, they, his technician said that the atomic clock wasn't working. And Which so the I culmination love, love of all thing. his life's work is not working, and it's not going to work in time for the, uh, the ball. So, so he started got drinking. Sauce. He started drinking. Yeah. He probably, probably got yeah. sauce. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, we'll shock him through this, but... Um, the master's plan starts to work. He starts taking the doctor's lives. Uh, somebody actually turns it into Paul McGann. Yeah, which is wild because the, when he turns into Paul McGann, he's doing the same shaky motion blur head thing that the master would later do in the end of time. This is something I will get into when I get to my uh, overall thoughts, but yes. Okay, yeah. Um, but it, it doesn't work out because uh, Grace saves the day thanks to alarm Grace. clocks. Yeah, Grace runs into the TARDIS console room and starts just pushing wires together, trying to jumpstart the thing. And she does well, it. Actually, she's trying to short it out, if I remember correctly. Well, whatever she does, it works. Yay! So, Last the TARDIS goes back in time, which, which um, 
breaks the link to the Eye of Harmony. Mm-hmm. So now the Master is dying. Grace runs in to try and save the Doctor from the evil uh, optician's contraption thing. And the Master just throws her off of the, of the ledge and kills the stone dead. Rip in peace. Yep. So the Doctor and the Master have their big, epic battle. And it's over in 20 and, seconds. And it's over in 20 seconds because the Master gets the Eye of Harmony. Bye! It, See you when you're Derek Jacoby! <laughs> it's over 20 seconds because he forgot that the Doctor had the high ground. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, that's also a Disney movie now, so he did the reference for me. He, he, also, he also tries to save the Master. The Master goes, no, no, lol, bye. Just let's go. <laughs> and get sucked into the Eye of Harmony. And we never see him again. He had the chance to change his fate. <laughs> God. God almighty. <laughs> but, you know, with all that sorted out, the master destroyed and the Eye of Harmony shut and everything, uh, well, it's too bad that we lost Grace Chang Lee. Ah, <laughs> nope. Have some regeneration energy, bitches. Clap your hands if you believe in fairies! Hey. It's Superman. It's the power of love, baby. Here you go. It's Superman know, one. I don't, I don't know what. By the, the way, fuck they're both here. alive now because that's happened, the way but, it always ends. But you know, you just gotta accept it. But I really like these scenes with Paul McGann and uh, Grace and Lee in the TARDIS because he's very doctorish now. He's uh, the crisis is over. He's got his memory back and all this shit. So he's very much in. This but his default mode uh, would have been, I guess. Or is in the audios. And yeah. It's, it's a funny he, line he where it's like... He congratulates him on being a place he's never been, i.e. dead, yeah. and coming back from it. Yep. And yeah, of course it makes sense because, you know, Grace's childhood dream was to was to turn back death, and she's done it, kind of. Yep. Yes. With that, she's got a, she's okay. got a dream. She's got a dream. They ask, where's the master? And the doctor just says, indigestion. I have so many. Yeah, they say, where's the master? There's a sound from the high harmony, and it just, oh, indigestion. (laughs) (laughs) And another lovely scene I like where he tries to get him back December 31st. Tars is going. It just stops. So he just uh, reaches forward. Quick thump. It's cute. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's, It's a thing that Peter Davison. Little touches like that make me really like this doctor. Yeah. Yeah. He got shafted so hard. He did, but he did. Yeah, we get our we get our wrap up. Grace and Lee don't go off in the TARDIS. They have one more smooch. It's really you know, typical. It's really stuff. sad because the Doctor was all like, "I can show you the world." Cat! <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's uh, the TV movie. At this point, it's, it's referenced Top Trumps. Chang, Chang. There is a little interesting bit where um. Chang gets to keep the, the, the bags of gold, presumably because he was manipulated, as long as he gives the Doctor his stuff back, which he does. Mm. And as he's walking off, he says, by the way, Chang, um, don't be here next Christmas. Mm. Which is implied that he's saving him for his future death. Uh-huh. Even though he already died. Hmm, <laughs> with the wobbly timey wimey. And then there's a nice bit where it's like, um, I was going to ask you to, to come with me, so I was going to ask you to stay with me. And they both realize that that's not going to happen. So they just kiss, and that's the end of the film. Mm-hmm. And that's the TV movie. Yep, that's the TV movie. I think I would like to go last, so it's between you two who wants to start us off. Cat, go ahead. Um, I mean, honestly, I, I can't really say too much about this. Um, just because it's, it's pretty much just a typical American TV movie, but with a Doctor Who twist. I've seen this sort of story before, not the exact story, obviously, but I've seen that, this formula before. I've seen it a lot of times. Um, so it, it was entertaining. I had a lot of fun with it, and, uh, some of the actors are very excellent. My favorite actor was John Sessions. For reasons. Lots of reasons. But, um. John Sessions. Yeah. John Sessions. Who was he? Oh, John um. Se- y- y- you'll, you'll figure it out. 
Chan. John Sessions is a, is a is a English actor. Yes. It's and Gus. He originally a, uh... <laughs> Hang on. What Disney movie was he? He's in? Gus. <laughs> what? He's the voice of Gus. <laughs> he auditioned to be the the doctor in this, alongside. Uh, they also asked Chris, Christopher Eccleston and Peter Capaldi. Oh my god! Amazing. Yep. But yeah, I, I just happened to notice that it's like he's my favorite actor in this, and he wasn't even in it. <laughs> <laughs> I was wanting to see when you two would get it. But oh, um, Jesus. yeah, it was eighty nine minutes of pretty unoffensive, fun doctor story. And we got to have, you know, a hammy guy playing the Doctor, which is always fun. And Paul McGann was fun, so I liked it. Okay. And, uh, For me, like, I said it the, when we picked it last time, uh, but, like, this is a movie I watch every set on New Year's Eve with a nice, you know, alcoholic beverage just to relax and unwind. So ring in the New Year with you know for us it's simple and easy. enjoy it on broadcast it was very much a whole where it was like oh god doctor who came back and it was just a shit tv movie and now the series is dead for good and all we've got are these audio and shit but for us now we can just go oh yeah that's an interesting weird cultural artifact like a liminal thing between the classic series and the new series because you can see a lot of the new in it I mean, it's done better in the news. Russell T. Davies learned from it, and also the way television evolved in times since 1996, between then and 2005. But this is an evolution in a different way. You could see what kind of a it would be. It would be campy and goofy and wild, but you can see the path that Doctor Who could have taken at this point. Paul McGann's lovely. And I really like him in the audios. So I'm glad that he's the eighth doctor. His era is an interesting one, but it was many people's pet era, so to speak. You know, if you lived through the wilderness years, not having Doctor Who on TV. Back then, I'm sure it was a traumatic thing. For Here and now, it's like fine. A little goofy and dumb, but it's harmless overall now. The show came back, so who can really complain? Yeah, harmless, unlike the official stuff that actually happens in the series, Chibnall. Yeah. Mm, well, well, in, in, in 15 years, people say that to them. Well, the show had a bit of rocky start here. It came back. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure people in the future will feel the same way about, about the Chibnall era. As we do about the movie right now. Yeah. Goofy, dumb, harmless, because the show kept going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Anik, what do you think? Okay, so, taken as a whole, this TV movie is not good. It's not. Uh, it's it has not. parts of it that I rather enjoy. Paul McGann's performance is great. Eric Roberts as a super hand master is fantastic. Uh... But the overall feel of it, the overall production, is a lot to be desired. However, I am eternally grateful to it because there are elements of this that were used later on in the official TV series. The time vortex on the uh, opening credits, that I think is an inspiration for the opening credits for Russell T. Davis's uh, time running the show. The half-human thing, Stephen Moffat references, of course. And, of course, that end-of-time-style uh, head uh, movement effect is later used for the, uh, the Master Race. So, this is a vital part of the show's legacy. Even if it's not very good in itself, it's vitally important that it happened, and for that I will be forever grateful for it. It's not a great story, but it has its moments, and we should be grateful for it. So, after that, I think we need a bit of a palate cleanser. So we're not going to review this, but we're just going to talk a little bit about The Night of the Doctor. The 2013, 2013 yeah, 2013 mini-episode that was put on to, to uh, basically tide us over 
before the day of the Doctor, the 50th anniversary. It was sort of the, the bridge between the Eighth Doctor and the, the War Doctor. Actually. Yeah. Which, it came out of nowhere, and like, I lost goddamn mind when this happened. But, oh, hey, they released a new mini-episode to tie into the 50th. Okay, let's watch this. Uh, oh my god, it's Paul McGann! Holy fucking shit! Yeah, yeah. that's basically... That's he basically made Paul mind. McGann canon. It starts with a spaceship crashing, the pilot yeah. Cass is asking for um, a doctor, and then we hear the words, I'm a doctor, but probably not the one you were expecting. And it's just, holy fuck! But, yeah, they made Paul McGann canon before. Shown... I, I think... Russell T. Davies showed a montage of all the doctors at some point, and Paul McGann was in there. Oh, I don't know. He's and always been considered like, canon. He's always been considered canon. Well, it was like t- touch and go right when the new series started. Like, does he count? Does he not count? Who knows? But eventually, a- after a couple of years, it was like, yeah, he can. Cass, by the way, is played by what's the name of the actress? Hang on a second. Um, she's been in Doctor Who before. Is the point? Emma Campbell Jones. Emma Campbell Jones. She was one of the doctors, uh, not not the Time Lord doctors, uh, in the Wedding of River Song. She's the first victim Ooh. of the eye patch. Oh damn! So she's now down twice in Doctor. Who. But yeah, the the whole thing of the mini episode is you know it's the classic companion invocation. You know, I want to see the universe. Not oh well, have I got some you it's a box that's bigger on the inside and we can travel and then everything goes to shit yeah because... this is a nice little subversion of the usual trope so usually yeah. the person is thrilled to be visiting the universe with a time lord unfortunately for the doctor he's picked a really bad time to reveal he's a time lord yeah because the this is bang in the middle of the time happy. war this is bang in the middle of the time war and the Time Lords are not the most popular creatures in the universe right now. So she outright refuses his help, and he's adamant to stay there. And they go down together. She she goes further than that. She actively crushes the ship and oh, the locks them off. Totally the ship was well, she doesn't crashed. crash the ship. She just closes the door so he can't help her. Yes. I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you, that sort of thing. Um, and happenstance would have it that they crash land on the planet Karn. Yeah. Yay. So, Which... remember how in series nine, uh, the character of Ohila was a was a big part of the of the finale. Mm-hmm. This is her debut. Yeah. And well, the Karn showed up in the four. Yeah, Which... but she's not in it. Well, she's not in it. No, I, no. I don't. But yeah, the sisterhood in general. The sisterhood in general were in were in the brain of Morbius. And also because I haven't brought him up enough, the brain of Morbius also. I <laughs> said there are pre Hartnell doctors that a certain someone decided needed an elaborate explanation to make canon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Look, long long story just, short, no. then the Doctor has actually died, but he's been brought back to life by uh, the sisterhood, who they've yeah. got. Hey, isn't that a bit of weird thematic mirroring, huh? Because yeah. the, oh, the eighth, do- the seventh Doctor regenerated after having officially died, and then comes back, and the eighth Doctor dies and then comes back long enough to regenerate. No, no, um, unexpected hit news here, though. It's just magic. Yep. Potions and shit. So he's got four minutes to live. Plenty of time. Marco, when he's currently writing a song about it, uh- <laughs> one could say he has but a moment to live. Eh. <laughs> You could say this is his four-minute warning. <laughs> um, yeah. but she's, she's yeah. trying to get him to, to take a potion and f- force a regeneration. He just wants to die. He, he thinks that they've done enough damage to the universe, and he just yeah. wants to, to flat-out die. She won't let this happen. And then, and then we get the reason that Cass is there in the first place. She is there just to show the Doctor exactly what the Time War is doing to the innocent people of the And he says the immortal lines, Warrior. There's no need for a Doctor anymore. Make me a warrior now. Doctor no more. Doctor no more. He screams at the sisterhood to get out. He, there's a lovely little bit where he says, will it hurt? She says, yes, good. And, and then we get Paul McGann's final words. Which first we get Big Finish becoming canon. Yeah. yeah. 
his um, his his companions are referenced. Grace is not referenced. I think there's weird rights issues because that was an American. Something I forgot to mention during the movie. Um, it was never the plan, by the way, for Grace to become a, a major companion. Even if the show had been picked up mm-hmm. off the back of the TV movie, she would not have been part of it. Oh yeah, I, I would figure if it did get as part of a show, they bring her back for like one episode. It was a, it was a one-time deal, apparently. But mm-hmm. um, I, I've got the list of the companions that are referenced here. Mm-hmm. Um, come on, Todd's wiki. Don't shit the bed. <laughs> I can tell you the list right off the top of my head. I mean, yeah, I know. I know. Charlie, that, um, Charlie, Harris, Lucy, Tams, and Mom. Lucy Bleeding Miller is canon. I love it. Oh, Lucy, have you have you heard any Lucy Miller? Oh yes. I knew you loved Lucy. It. Well, she's from Blackpool. Go represent. Cat, imagine. <laughs> Cat, imagine a fusion of Rose Tyler and Donna Noble. That's Lucy oh Miller God. and Clara, be- Clara being from Blackpool. So a little bit of Clara and, in there as well. Well, yeah. Yeah, but Charlie, Chris, Lucy, Thames, and Molly. Lucy's incredible, but yeah, I I really love Charlie. She's great. yeah. Charlie is great. Um, she's in one of the best best big Finnish audios ever made, which is The Chance of Midnight. Yeah, that so is a phenomenal good story. That's another thing I forgot to mention, considering after the movie, you know, Paul McGann was incumbent doctor now so they made a shitload of things big finish eventually took over and they did audios stay paul mcgann did get his era even when there wasn't really a show going on he did and it's fantastic it's pretty good the paul mcgann audios are really 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 good they vary in quality but there are some really good they they vary in quality but you could actually see these being televised Mm -hmm. exactly so he does get his era Unofficially, in I mean, a roundabout way, the, the show, the show making big finish can is, throws a wrench into the people who liked the uh, novels that the Eighth Doctor had because yeah. completely different set of companions and continuity. Bullshit. Yeah, but you know that's but you know Nick Briggs of Big Finish does. It's obvious what side they were going to pick. Yeah, uh, but, but his his yeah. final but words. It is nice to see though. His final, his final words, words after he, after he says I. Loving companions, I, I know and salute you. Cast, I apologize. Physician, heal thyself. Bam, boom, drinks the potion, and here comes John Hurt. No, here Thank comes you, a CGI right. younger version of John Hurt. Oh, it's still the same thing. It's, and it's still John Hurt. As Kat said, Doctor No More. And we get his official name, the War Doctor. I, I think he should have been called the Warrior. Hmm. More Doctor works. Like, he does I suppose accept- it's a play on Warrior, isn't it? He does accept the role of Doctor at the end of the day. Yeah. If you say it quick, Warrior, War Doctor, yeah. It works. Which, talking about people who deserved an era, mm, John Hurt. Yeah, oh, rest, in God, yes. rest in peace. Rest in peace to John. He didn't, get, he didn't get too much. He got a couple. Of- he did get Engines of War, which is fantastic. I haven't read that actually. Oh God! Well, I really well listen because it's an audio book as well. But yes. Okay. Well, either way, I can read faster than they can. Read, he so. does get a, a, a Time War series, and it's terrific. Mm. Sadly, we won't get another but one for obvious that's, reasons. That's the end of Palm again. We because the fiftieth really resolving the Time War is a big metaphor for finally coming to terms with Doctor Who being cancelled and all that shit. Yeah. Which tying Palm again into it is kind of fun. It, it's good it's catharsis. I, I'm glad they did the mini episode. I'm glad that Paul McGann finally got to appear in a televised story. Yeah, well, he it deserved better. It was televised. It was on the BBC Red Button. He got he got a pretty good run, I say, considering the spin-off material. And that's another reason why I'm thankful for the TV movie, because without that, we'd never have gotten his big finish run. Yeah. So, so the movie not that great, for- but it gave us Paul McGann, and we'll be forever grateful for that. So, I wonder uh, if we'll be forever grateful with your next pick, however, Freezing Inferno. Li- listen, yeah. listen, listen. Okay, Raniac, you picked a story that you thought would be good but turned out to be bad. Cat picked a story that was kind of a troll, I think, in a way. Technically, that was your fault. You you chose. I well, can't wait to see where this is had- going. 
Okay. So I'm just going to be underwater just, menace. No, it's not the underwater. I'm going to be I'm going to be nice. I'm not going to fuck around. Just pick a story that is really good. Just 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 a straight. It's a big oh, Gonzo. No, it's definitely but the underwater menace. It's, it's not the underwater. What menace. is it? <laughs> what is it? <clears throat> Next time on Doctor Who reviews, Peter Davison in Snake Dance. Oh. Ho, 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 ho. I don't know this one. Is this the one that comes before or after Kinder? After. I had a fear you might do this. Yeah. Wait, it's not See, called Kinda? No, it's Kinder. called Kinder. I've seen oh, Kinder and not seen Snake Dance, so I'm glad you've picked this. Uh, oh, you've seen Kinder. You know then, I was tempted to pick Kinder solely for that finale, but Snake Dance is a little better overall. We so. can reference that finale to set up Snake Dance, that's fine. <laughs> I, I've seen that finale, I do believe, so... Okay, then you know exactly what bullshit I'm talking about. That finale you know is what? I know you know exactly what, you know what? what bullshit is. Raniac, Raniac, put it on the screen. Put it on the screen right now. Yes. This is why I, this yes, is, sir. This is why I would pick Kinder. I will do that, sir. <laughs> this is why I would pick Kinder. But Snake Dance, a little better. More, It's a little better. So we're just going to we're just gonna watch a good Doctor Who story. No trolling, no gonzo-like bullshit. Well, well Kinder's kind Snake Dance is kind of gonzo bullshit, but it's good gonzo bullshit. Damn it. I'm looking forward to that, then. So, uh, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Thank you, then, yep. for listening to us talking about the Doctor Who TV movie. And thank you to Kat for picking it. You're welcome. Thank you to Kat as well, and to, and to Jerry for um, putting up with my bullshit again. And <laughs> Your bullshit. And to I'm me for putting up with their oh, bullshit trust me, again. I was the one giving all the bullshit. Thanks also to, th- thank you also to myself for putting up with their bullshit again. Uh, <laughs> and we'll see you next time for Snake Dance. Hey. Until then, bye for now. Jafar up in the house, yo. They called it a lot of things. Let's just call it the team. Good was not one of them. <laughs> okay. Well, I enjoyed at least, it. We're, at least we're not going to play it up like a, we're not going to play it up like about time did. Oh God, no. Which uh, what what was that again? Let me just. Uh, I don't know, but um, please. God, no, please, make it stop, no! Let's get going. So, um, I'll, yeah, I'll count us in with cats screaming in my ears. Uh, <laughs> Hello. I've got the window open because it's hot as shit in here. So That's fine. If we hear crows gonna, or whatever, we'll just, we'll just gonna, go with it. We're going to risk motorbikes because I need to not boil a little bit. can it. Uh, <laughs> Telephone can it. <laughs> Were we reco- are we recording right now? Timing! Are we recording oh, right now? Yes! <laughs> Hello, Blooper Reel. Good to see you again. It's always nice. I- I Mr. Anderson, always welcome nice. back. We've missed you. <laughs> Mr. Anderson. You like what I've done with the place? Thank you. <laughs> God. Oh, we're so fucked. Anyway, hi, Bl- hi Blooper Reel. Uh, yeah. I always like the, the blooper reel bits where we say hi blooper reel come before we do the shows, but it comes at the end of the show <laughs> when you're watching. So it's like it's almost like Tommy Wimey. Isn't that funny? Anyway. Maybe that's well, what, maybe that's like why I do it. The beginning and the end are mirroring each other. Maybe that's exactly <laughs> what Maybe that's exactly why I do it like that, ignoring that last remark.